of the money, of the executive, executive of uh, IMA Kodam Barkam, and my dear friends, many of whom I keep saying over and again, over and over again, very small. Uh, it's an immense pleasure to be here. I think this is the fourth or the fifth time I'm here at IMA Kodam Barkam meeting. Thank you all for the song. Uh, when the topic of uh, management of heart failure uh, was voted to me, I thought it was still too long. So uh, I thought I'd just uh, address the manipulate the topic. So I made it current therapy of heart failure rather than management. Because management of heart failure would be a very, very large topic. And uh, most of you are experts in uh, managing heart failure in your digital practice. Uh, managing heart failure is with uh, type of walking. It's uh, fraught with uh, various complications from the very treatment that we do. Medications that we give for heart failure cause uh, side effects complications and you give one medicine you have another problem so the medicine itself can be a problem at times. Uh, in definition uh, it's a clinical syndrome of inadequate oxygen delivery to the metabolic tissues because of inadequate cardiac output which results from any cardiac structural or functional impairment either of ventricular filling which is a diastolic event or ejection of blood which is a systolic event. That is why we have two components in heart failure. One is systolic heart failure, where there's a difficulty in pumping the blood, or diastolic heart failure, where there's a deficiency of ventricular filling. Now, if you look at the situation in India, you can see that there are about one and a half million to 4.6 million patients, the prevalence, and incidence is almost half a million to 1.8 million. And there is a rise in uh, risk factors of traditional diseases. All of you know that we are the diabetic capital of the world. I don't have to stress this. Uh, many diabetic centers would have told you that. And then there is a persistence of pre transitional diseases. All of that doubles the burden of heart failure in India. There are also multiple risk factors which increases the prevalence of congestive heart failure. Hypertension. You look at uh, any patient today. Uh, oh. <coughs> yeah, hypertension uh, itself, there are about 295,000 to 1.8 million patients. In diabetic, there are about 184,000. Of course, obesity, of which I am a classic example, and coronary heart disease, which is again due to about 1.75 million people, is a rising prevalence. All this leads to the rising prevalence of heart failure in India. And uh, today, uh, earlier we were thinking, we were uh, bothered about the addiction factor. If anything is less than 35%, it is called as severe heart failure. And I think more than that was called as uh, heart failure with mild or more than 50 is called as normal. Uh, today, we have three criteria of which uh, the, uh, you have got right, one, two, and three. There is a mid heart failure, that is heart failure with middle reduce addiction fraction, that is from EM of 40 to 49 percent. This is a new category. You are not familiar with reduced addiction fraction, where the addiction fraction is less than 40 percent. You are also familiar with reserved addiction fraction, where it is more than 50 percent. But I want to introduce you to this new thing, which is known as mid-range uh, heart failure, which is uh, recently introduced in the uh, European Society of Cardiology, 2016, as LVF from 40 to 49 percent with the elevated levels of natriuretic peptide and at least one additional criteria that is there may be a relevant structural heart disease either hypertrophy or left atrial enlargement or diastolic dysfunction. So these are the three types of heart failure we have today. Earlier we had only two and in between there was a fourth category also. Now if you look at the pathophysiology of heart failure, what, what starts off is a damage to the cardiac myocyte and extracellular matrix with result in a change in the shape, shape and function of the heart and cardiac wall, wall stress. 
there is a systemic neurohormonal overactivation which is a response to this damage. So because the heart has somehow to work and keep the circulation going, it goes on for various compensating mechanisms. And these are vasoconstriction, fibrosis, hypertrophy, cellular and molecular alteration, myotoxins. All of this leads to maladaptive remodeling and progressive worsening of LV function and hemodynamic alterations which lead to salt and water tension. These are the ones which give rise to heart failure symptoms, that is dyspnea, edema, and fatigue. And uh, this remodeling gives rise to mor morbidity and mortality in the form of arrhythmias and heart failure. Now, because of this uh, compensatory mechanism, there is an overactivation of the retin, the retin angiotensin aldosterone system and the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for most of the symptoms. So, an increase in the sympathetic nervous system, the vasoconstriction, which is vasopressin heart rate increases, contractility increases. Reticular, I mean, uh, retin angiotensin aldosterone system will cause vasoconstriction. The blood pressure increases, sympathetic tone increases, hypertrophic fibrosis. And on the other side, you have the natural diuretic peptide system, which causes, which is released, and these help in reducing the blood pressure by vasodilatation, reduces sympathetic tone, natural diuretic <coughs> and reduces aldosterone, tries to reduce fibrosis. Now, these can be beneficial to the patient, whereas all of these are harmful. So, we, uh, we have had medications that tend to act on this, uh, these various systems in the uh, uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone and sympathetic nervous system. And if you look at the progress of the uh, drugs which was used for heart failure, the, one of the first drugs which came was enalaprin, uh, which was ACE inhibitor. And if you look at, this was compared with placebo and they found a reduced mortality. The next drug was, uh, uh, was again, bisoprolol, a beta blocker. This beta blocker caused a 34 percent reduction of all-cause mortality, and this was called the CP2 trial. Then came the CHARM trial in Tansy Sartan, 23 percent reduction in mortality, and then again, uh, Tansy Sartan, which reduced a 15 percent reduction in mortality. The SHIFT trial, trial Ivabradin, again there was a 18 percent reduction in mortality, and then Emphasis trial, which used Eprinuron, there was a 37 percent decrease in mortality. And today, we have a paradigm heart heart failure trial, which, uh, which compared NCS696, that is an RD, uh, was an enalapril, and this showed a 20% reduction mortality. Now, the reason why I showed this particular uh, chart, which shows the progress of various trials in heart failure, if you look at any of the drugs, whether it is enalapril, bisoprolol, cadisartan, and um, cadisartan, and ivabradin, all of these, they had placebo as a comparison. But if you look at this drug, NCS696, that is Sacrobital with Valsartan, which is the latest drug, and which is called as RD, it was compared with Adalapril. And when it was compared with Adalapril, it was found that this shows a 20% additional reduction in cardi cardiovascular mortality or heart failure hospitalization. So ladies and gentlemen, I just would like to draw your attention to this, that this new drug which has come will give added benefits compared to ACE inhibitor and enalapril, which we have been all using as a first line of treatment for heart failure. Over and above that, you get 20% reduction uh, in mortality. Now, uh, we have been using Digitalis from the time of joined medicine, uh, Shani Medical College way back in 1972 when I came to the clinical. Many of my teachers are all sitting here, Dr. Mani and others here. And, uh, what uh, we had is only two or three drugs, digitalis classics, digitalis classic. You go to the cardiology opening for any disease, finally the prescription is the same. So uh, I was a little disillusioned with cardiology at that time because they could use a lot of time for putting the stethoscope, come to a diagnosis, and finally the prescription is the same. Uh, now what happens is digitalis from a compound where like a carrot which was placed in front of the donkey. And the next drug which came was beta blockers which act on the sympathetic nervous system. Now what beta blockers in effect do is they limit the donkey speed. So it limits the heart speed by reducing the heart rate and therefore uh, saves energy and helps the heart to recover a little of its energy. Then of course there were the renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors, which include ACE inhibitors, ARBs and MRAs. And what they do is they reduce the number of sacs on the wagon. 
you see this donkey has been pulling this thing. What A sediment doesn't do? They reduce the low upper load of the heart. That is the mechanism of action. And that's how the donkey is able to still pull the heart although it is weak. Now, we have recently some new drugs and some new ways of treating. One of them is ivermectin, which is used to reduce the heart rate. Angiotensin receptor, nephrolysin inhibitor, NCSS 696, which is sad, which is this 696 is a combination of sacrobital with versatin. and versatin is an ARB. It, then we have intravenous iron for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which was proven by the confirmed heart failure trial. And then you have genetic treatment, which is which is on the horizon. Uh, Ivermectin is used whenever the resting heart rate is more than 70 beats beat per minute or higher, and has been found to have beneficial effect. What Ivermectin does is. Uh, whenever there is, there is the, the sinus node which is located here is a pacemaker pattern, it's a pacemaker site. What it does is, uh, what happens there is, uh, during the resting phase of the thing, the action potential, the, the thing becomes less electronegative, that is from minus 70, it reaches minus 40, and this is the threshold electronegativity beyond which it fires the action potential spontaneously. That is why it is known as a spontaneous pacemaker. What Ivabradin does is, it acts on this ion here and it gently depresses the slope of this, uh, this uh, repolarization. So what happens is, it becomes slower, the heart rate becomes slower compared to what? Remember, Ivabradin should be used only in a patient with sinus tachycardia. Please do not use it in arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation or ventricular failure. It has no effect there. If there is an automatic so the uh, territory, like the sinus node, only there it, is, it has its effect by acting on what is known as the funny current, that is the eye of the So this is a new drug which we can use in patients who have got a uh, heart rate of more than 70 million, uh, beats per minute despite the use of your beta blockers or digoxin. Now it has been shown in the SHIFT trial which came out in 2010 that there is an 80 percent relative risk reduction of ivermectin, and ivermectin is used compared to placebo for cardiovascular mortality. Now, coming to uh, the 696 LCZ, the nephrolysin inhibitor. Now, what you see here, we have seen this chart, uh, this slide earlier, because there is a overactivation of the renin angiotensin adjuvant and sympathetic, which are basically the reason for this is because of compensation. The heart cannot pump. Earlier it was pumping 60 ml of blood or 70 ml of blood for every beat. When the heart fails, it is not able to keep that volume up. The volume comes down to 30 ml. It is able to pump only 30 or 35 ml. So what to do? It increases its speed so that it tries to match, keep the output. Then only the various metabolizing tissues receive adequate blood. So this is a compensatory mechanism. But unfortunately, that very compensatory mechanism which is supposed to aid the body during a heart failure will also turn out to be its nemesis and cause more injury. And that is why we have to have drugs to act against us. We have ACE inhibitors and AR, <coughs> the beta blockers here we have already saw. Uh, uh, we have beta blockers which block the sympathetic nervous system. We have inhibitors of RAID, ACE, ARPs, and MRA which block the channel. And now we have drugs which are able to integrate <laughs> natriuretic peptides. Now, uh, how do we go about this? Now, nephrolysis inhibition must be accompanied by simultaneous renin angiotensin blocking. Why? You see, what happens is when you give these nephrolysis inhibitors, they act here uh, on this thing. So, what happens is the concentration of angiotensin 1 and inactive fragments increases because you are inhibiting this thing goes. And angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 concentration increases. And if these two are back on angiotensin receptor, all those unwanted effects will increase. So you also have to block angiotensin receptor if you were to give a nephrolysin. So nephrolysin cannot be given alone. It has to be combined with something which will block here. Now if you you can give ACE inhibitors, but when, the problem with ACE inhibitors is they increase they increase some side effects like dry cough and of course potentially dangerous angio, uh, angioedema. Because of that, ACE inhibition is not the correct choice. And earlier trials which used ACE inhibitor in the, in the heart failure trials which were done earlier, they used nephrolysis inhibitor along with ACE inhibitor. And they found, although there were beneficial effects of mortality, they found that the side effects were much more. 
Therefore, it was decided to use angiotensin receptor blockers, and that's what you have today in MS696, which is a salt combination of uh, two active compounds, acubitrin, which is a prodrug, and further metabolized to nephrolysin inhibitor, NBQ657, and valsartan. The combination of this has been tried in this paradigm not failure trial, and it was found that in this patient, there was a significant uh, reduction in the cum uh, cumulative probability of death. I and mean, when it was concluded that this uh, compound was superior to enilaparin in reducing the risk of death and of hospitalization for heart failure. Remember, it is superior to enilaparin. Not just the same effect as not non inferior, it is superior and it is not placebo. So, therefore, you can be assured that when you use this drug, you can, have, you can expect a better response in your heart failure patient. And the primary outcome has been a 20% reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure, hospitalization, 21% reduction in heart failure or hospitalization. And secondary outcome, 16% reduction of all-cause mortality. And it was superior in reducing symptoms and physical limitations of heart failure. The other reason that advances and tendency of heart failure are cardiac myosin activators and subtraction. I don't want to go into this because these are just in the pipeline. Now, this is one drug which is available today, very Ferric carboxy uh, uh, mortase. Ferric carboxy mortase is an organic form of iron which can be used for your heart failure patient and it can be considered as a treatment. Trials have shown, confirmed HF and fair HF, that uh, ferric carboxy mortase in a weekly dose of 200 mg or uh, 1 gram to 2 gram, single dose in once a week, you have to check ferritin and saturated iron uh, at least once in, two, once in three months and uh, make sure that you don't overdo your treatment. And uh, uh, the European guidelines have shown, I'm just going through some slides very rapidly. All of these slides have shown very, you know, class one B indication. That is for fish for using of RB, when you use ACE inhibitor or RB with RB again, uh, it is level of indication is one. So all, and here for riboparadine, the, uh, the recommendation is 2A, but the level of the evidence is BR. And uh, with that, I, uh, we will go to the next for about devices and mechanical things which can be used. You all know that heart failure, with, uh, many of the patients you will see with heart failure have got a left bundle back block. What it means is the electrical conduction takes a little more deal time in reaching the left side of the heart compared to the ventricular mm -hmm. septum and therefore the two uh, portions of the heart do not move synchronously. Now if you have a synchronous thing only you can squeeze the blood. If it were to come at a little later stage, that synchronicity is affected and therefore ejection is reduced. And this is what we want to do by uh, desynchronization, I mean resynchronization therapy. Then of course you need to prevent sudden cardiac death, you have annulus reduction surgery and devices for immediate <laughs> counterpulsation. We'll just quickly go through all this in the interest of time. Cardiac resynchronization therapy as you can see, uh, ventricular desynchrony is found to be in 27% of 53% of patients. And you, you see, the wider the QRS, if you have a patient with a normal QRS, the survival is very high. But if the QRS duration increases, the survival is grossly affected, which is seen in this particular trial. And cardiac resynchronization trial, again, we go to our donkey. It is like providing the donkey's legs with rollers so that the heart can function better. It can carry the same load, and the heart can really work better. So that is how cardiac resynchronization therapy is. What we do in cardiac resynchronization therapy is, all of you are familiar with pacemakers where you can pace the atrial for patients with six sinus syndrome, if patients have AV conduction defects, you can pace the right ventricle, but in patients with heart failure, we pace three locations, atria, right ventricle, and the left ventricle by this left ventricle gene. This is known as triple chamber pacing or cardiac resynchronization therapy. <laughs> what we aim to do is, we try to see that the current reaches the right side as well as the left side at the same time, therefore reducing the transit loss, the transit loss in time to win black muscle uh, cases. And are these really effective? Yes, they are. If you look at cardiac discipline and control, there is a significant improvement in survival in these patients. And this is a patient of mine, a uh, <laughs> patient from uh, Uganda. As you can see, this line which shows that the interventricular septum is contracting a little later than the posterior wall showing that there is disynchrony, but after, pay, after putting it in the pacing, it becomes synchronous. And this can also be seen in uh, tissue Doppler imaging. You can see the lines are all very different here. 
they are not synchronous, I am sorry, this is the one, it is not synchronous here, but after if they all of them come in the same line, indicating synchrony. Uh, so, indication for cardiac resynchronization therapy today is patients should be symptomatic, NYHA class 3 or 4, that is symptomatic, even at rest, and the QRS must be greater than 130 milliseconds. Preferably for the patient to have the ECG left bundle band block, but even right bundle band block, that is greater than 130, 160 milliseconds are also used. And avoiding indications is that they can be used for later. Uh, Implantable cardiac water defibrillators are used for preventing sudden cardiac death because pioneered by visual narrow screen. This is how ICDs look. What they look is they monitor the heart rate, if there is a VF, it gives a shock and converts it to a sinus rhythm. And today, we have uh, devices, combo devices, which can treat heart failure as well as sudden cardiac death. And this is how the X-ray of the patient looks after the sudden cardiac death. I just don't want to go into the, all the trials have clearly shown a 31% to 54% improvement in survival. Uh, indication class 1 is cardiac arrest, spontaneous sustained BP, syncope of undetermined origin, and NSVT with pulmonary artery disease. But today, you can control this patient with remote device. Even if the patient is sleeping at home, uh, you can keep monitoring it from your hospital. The patient may not know the problem, but you as a physician and a, in an older hospital can identify if he has had an arrhythmia and you can call the patient, ask him to come out to the hospital. So such is the development of the of course, these are all surgical devices, my practice, all the things which are available. Counter pulsation, one word about IADP. IADP is very useful for unloading the heart and reducing the disease. And then you have enhanced external counter pulsation, where depending on the ECG, you have three cuffs one in the cuff, one in the lower thigh, one in the upper thigh, and it starts contracting at different points of the ECG during. Uh, diastasis so that the blood is pushed upwards in the artery and gives a better uh, diastolic filling of the coronary artery. ECP has been used even in heart failure patient as this uh, trial from our uh, center shows and uh, reticular assist devices are being used to promote as uh, a bridge to treatment for patients who are waiting for heart transplant. We have done about 78 heart transplants in our hospital and as you all, some of you know, Dr. Cherry has, and our hospital has been the pioneer mm -hmm. uh, who has set the road uh, of Tamil Nadu becoming the number one state for heart transplants in the country. More than two thirds of the heart transplants throughout the country are done in Chennai. It's something we can all be proud of. And uh, these uh, ventricular assist devices uh, will provide the blood uh, into, from the left ventricle into the aorta in a patient with um, who will in state failure waiting for a transplant. ECMO is one thing which can be used in the ICU. Not to forget, as an electrophysiologist, I have to mention this. Uh, radio frequency operation. <coughs> radio frequency operation can be used in patients uh, who have got uh, tachycardia myopathy or ventricular arrhythmias, which can lead to heart failure. And finally, the research field, we are in this particular track for atom heart failure, where we target the sympathetic nervous system by a pacemaker device, which is implanted in the neck. The, the electrodes are connected to the vagus nerve in the neck, and there is a pacemaker which is implanted in the chest wall. So we have done two patients, but the results cannot be there, you know, because the trial is ongoing. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, trying to take home, I would like to state, ACE inhibitors and ARP are class 1 recommended treatments for heart failure and reduced EM. Uh, RP is an additional armor in the battle against heart failure where patients continue to be symptomatic despite ACE inhibitors and ARP. <coughs> you can switch over these ACE inhibitors or ARPs to armors and you will have better response. Parenteral ion therapy is useful in iron deficient patients. Ivabrad and useful adjunct when heart rate with, uh, above 70. Gene therapy holds promise in the future. Newer drug combinations are coming which are quite helpful to you. Device options for heart failure have widened. Patients awaiting transplant have been taken off transplant to stop the cardiac resynchronization therapy which I mentioned, LVADs and the artificial heart. ICDs have caused significant reduction of mortality. Percutaneous treatment of vascular rehabilitation for those not operable are available. Today we are doing transarterial aortic valve replacements in patients 
art failure. There's not a knife to put on this weapon, except for a small sheet in the drawing. That is TA via trans catheter, IRT fiber this. And all these provide hope for those without hope. Thank you very much for the day. Thank you, Anna. My request, Dr. Marsarni. My request, Dr. Any lesson to handle the certificate of appreciation to Dr.